Hello, I'm Sean Murray and this is The Conversation, where we take an alternative look at political events and current affairs around Ireland. In this show we hope to pick, probe, investigate and uncover the stories that you want to hear. We go where mainstream won't go. On today's show we will discuss the role of the media. The study of mainstream media's role during the recent conflict in Ireland has been a source of interest around the world. Historically, state interference in broadcasting underscored the perceived dangers in allowing alternative radical voices to challenge the political status quo. These measures were seen to be a pragmatic approach in dealing with organisations that were willing to subvert the democratic institutions of the land. My next guest could be seen to be a central figure in the battle of narratives during the recent conflict. Before I introduce today's guests, we took our cameras to the streets to get the public's take and how much faith they have in the media. No, I don't have much faith in the media. Um, I think, that, well, some of it paints a false image of life. It's, I think it's altered to suit, suit whoever is broadcasting it and whatever is the agenda behind it, so no. <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm perfectly honest, I would say uh, no. I would say no. Uh, I'm, very, I'm very angry uh, sometimes at the headlines I see in newspapers like the Mail, the Sun and the other rubbish right-wing press. Um, the Guardian, yeah, yeah, but on the whole, no, no. I think it's all, it's all controlled. The BBC is, at the moment, I think the BBC is appalling. Uh, Programmes that people used to watch, Question Time's a prime example. Question Time now should just be, be told, should just be called uh, Tory time, because that, that's all it is. So the, the bottom line to that is, have I got faith in the media? No. I believe that the media can be used for good, especially in terms of reporting on campaigns by community groups or local organisations, the likes of that. But I also believe the media is very often used as the biggest tool in distraction and culture wars. And most of the time, the stuff we're seeing on the media is sensationalised, maybe the um, emphasis is put on the wrong things to distract from cases of other maybe marginalisation or corruption in government or in companies, organisations that are functioning on a much higher level than community and aren't based in grassroots community work. And as I said, the media is very often used to perpetrate certain things that distract regular people on the ground from the real problems that are going on. I do have faith in the media um, in many ways, um, especially with you know recent events that happened there through, through being contacted through the media, with um, being attacked by loyalists, youths and stuff. But it has its uh, negatives too. You have to be extra, extra careful of, you know, there's a lot of negative and, you know, lies being put out through the media as well. So you have to be extra careful of what what, who's right and who's wrong. So it's it's very, very important that you, 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 you get the right information, but it's crucial. And I think it's, you know, you'd be lost without it, to be truthful. Um, not particularly. Uh, well, growing up here in Northern Ireland and stuff, what I've seen myself, uh, for myself, and then looking at the media and their narrative, then um, that's, I've grew sceptical over the years. And then the last load of years here, well, COVID and, uh, Russia, Ukraine, stuff like that there, um, it's made me even more sceptical. As always, we're joined by our resident co-host Michelle Gildernew. Michelle is the current MP for Fermanagh and South Tyrone. She has served in the Northern Ireland Assembly as a former Minister for Agriculture and Rural Development and chairperson of the Health Committee, amongst other things. She's been a Sinn Féin activist since her teens and has been elected almost continuously since 1998. And today's special guest needs no introduction in Ireland. He is a former IRA prisoner, director of publicity for Sinn Féin and editor of the political newspaper and Fublat. He is now also an accomplished author and playwright. Please welcome Donny Morrison. Thank you. Good to be here. So Donny, do you recall when you became first enamoured by the world of publicity? Well, it was a very long time ago. I think it was actually in primary school. Uh, beside me in class was a very rich kid called Joe McGee. And Joe ha asked me to write comics. And so I drew the comics and put in my own text and dialogue. And in every comic, Joe was the hero at the end of the story. Uh, but I, I suppose I was also attractive. I mean, I was studying English at school. And then in 1968, I was involved with a group 
cross community group of people who were amateur ham. We built our own pirate radio stations, which went on the air after Radio Ulster went off. And basically, we were nerds. We just talked about electronic parts, etc. But whenever the crisis came in August 1969, and our areas were attacked and the barricades went up, I was asked by an IRA man, would I be prepared to put my transmitter uh, behind the barricades as Radio Free Belfast? So my transmitter was operating from above the Long Bar in Leeson Street. And interestingly enough, I had worked with the, the owner of the Long Bar, Paddy Lenehan, and his daughter uh, became the future pre president of Ireland, Mary McAleese. So we were working, I, was, I put the transmitter in that station and uh, it would broadcast proper news, it would quell any rumours about, you know, false rumours going around about an attack on an area. We give out GAA results. And I also remember, which I consider to be quite, quite uh, you know, sad, plaintive in a way. I remember going down to the radio station, Radio Free Belfast one day, and there was a whole pile of kids standing down the, down the landing, right onto the street, with tiny bits of paper. And it was requests for their mother or their granny, it was her birthday, would you play such and such an Irish song? And, you know, it just struck me that our music had never been played uh, on, the, on the radio, on the North or on television, just as uh, there was massive restrictions on reporting GAA games because of the, the British mm -hmm. culture of this state and the, the anti-niceness sentiment within it. So I was involved in that and then uh, I secretly sold Republican news from underneath my coat outside St Paul's Chapel. Uh, the British Army were already in at that stage. They were already taken, come into our areas and built, built uh, barracks, etc. Uh, and then during, just in the run up to internment, or just after internment, each area in Belfast, each Republican area, produced its own little news sheet, sort of mosquito press. Gestetner produced these very simple uh, magazines which would, you know, express solidarity with the internees and give local gossip and things like that, local jokes, give uh, a platform to some kid, maybe who was a good cartoonist. So I was involved in writing for, for it. And then uh, it, came, it came sort of a personal crisis in my life where my friends were getting arrested and tortured. Uh, the British Army were sealing off the streets and doing house-to-house -house searches. They were personally very aggressive with us and very violent with us. And I was studying, at this stage, I was studying A-level English and History at the College of Business Studies. And uh, I just realised I couldn't go on with that. So I just walked out of the college and got involved with the Republican movement. And by the end of 1972, I was in Long Cash as an internee. I became the PRO in Cage 2. And I also met a man called Francie Brawley who was a school teacher who was interned, and he was very, very encouraging because I wanted to be a writer. And he was very, he encouraged me, and he went over uh, stories that I, that I had written. So I, come, I got released from internment, but I was only out two or three weeks when the British Army came looking for me again. So I was back on the run throughout 1974. And it was only when the IRA called a ceasefire in December 1974 that I was actually able to sort of walk the streets uh, without getting arrested constantly. And it was at that, in the summer of 1975, I was 22 years of age, and I was asked by a veteran Republican, Billy McKee, did I think, I, could I edit Republican news? You know, and I, I jumped at it, of course, absolutely no problem, being quite arrogant at that age, you know, quite cocky. I had no experience of how to produce, it was a professionally produced paper. So I, I became the editor of Republican News. I wrote, the first thing I did was I wrote into Long Cash and asked Jerry Adams would he write a weekly column for it. Uh, and he did. And we, we started to professionalise the paper. I mean, we were operating under severe restrictions. Our office on the Falls Road, there was a loyalist planted a car bomb across the street. Uh, our driver uh, was shot and wounded delivering the papers. The British Army would read it all the time seized our photographic archive, seized our equipment, seized our, seized our telex machine, and eventually they ended up arresting all of us and charging and putting 14 of us in jail, all related to the publication of Republican News. I, I defended myself uh, in the double court, uh, got bail, and we launched a big campaign about free speech, and the British government eventually dropped the charges in 1979. So Danny, you were working during that very stringent period of censorship by both the British and Irish governments during the recent conflict. Can you tell us about your role and how that worked out? 
Well, they formalized the censorship in 1988, but prior to that, there was, I mean, the, the BBC and ITN, we were always treated in a hostile fashion in any interview we did. I mean, if, even if I called a press conference to talk about education or health cuts, the, me, the first question on the agenda was, the IRA did this, the IRA did that. And in a, in a sense, they were turning us into proxy IRA spokespersons, and Margaret Thatcher was later to use that, mm -hmm. that, that excuse to uh, completely ban Sinn Féin from the airwaves. But pr pr prior to that, as I said, they, they had arrested all of us. Our spokespersons were shot, shot dead. I mean, uh, Maura Drum, the vice president of Sinn Féin, the pr people came into the ho modern hospital dressed as doctors and killed her in her bed because she was a great spokesperson for, uh, for our struggle. Uh, so we had a real hostile media. The Irish government, of course, w gave the lead to the British in this respect. They introduced the uh, Section 31 of the Broadcasting Act in 1972 as soon as they could because what they did not want was the people in the south of Ireland to hear the truth about what the nationalist community was experiencing because then that would put an onus on them to do something about it. So instead they preferred to uh, work in security with the British, security collaboration, and they both then signed up to the same narrative. The Republicans, the nationalist community, were, the, were to blame. And the, what's really interesting is that they totally ignore all the deaths and killings by the state before that. Like Sammy Devaney being beaten to death in his house by the OUC after a civil rights march. Like nine-year-old Patrick Rooney being shot dead in bed by the OUC in August 1969, which triggered the barricades going up. Like the first British soldier, a Catholic trooper who, who became home on leave, defending the, the Catholic people in the Falls Road, shot dead by the RUC. So from as far as the British government, the Irish government and the media, the mainstream media is concerned, they date the trouble from the day that the IRA fires its first shot, which is meant two years after mm -hmm. all the earlier deaths. And Donny, many analysts would say that this only streamlined and shaped the, the party into a, a more sophisticated political machine. W would you agree with that? Well, we, we received no formal training in public relations or in public speaking. So we learnt the hard way. And as I say, we were always treated in a hostile fashion by very polished mainstream British presenters who, you know, Oxford, Cambridge and all that were trained in public speaking and university uh, debates, etc. But we, we learnt the hard way. And in fact, we, we were got into a position where we were able to anticipate the next question and were always prepared. We were always complaining to the National Union of Journalists, and why aren't you opposing censorship? But in the South, interestingly, they approached Conor Cruz O'Brien, the Minister of Posts and Telegraphs, and they said to him, drop censorship. Let us at Adams and Morrison. We'll take them asunder in the studio. In other words, we'll do your work for you. And Conor Cruz O'Brien turned around and says, you must be joking. They would take you apart. <laughs> You're still tuned into The Conversation, your weekly alternative probe of political events and current affairs around Ireland. Michelle Gilderdew and Danny Morrison are my special guests. We're now living in the digital age. The reach and monopoly of mainstream broadcasters has somewhat waned in recent years. Do you now see the democratization of various narratives surfacing? Is it easier for marginalized voices to be platformed with the proliferation of digital and social media? Well, there's no doubt about it. Had we access to Twitter and other uh, social media platforms, when the broadcasting ban was introduced in 1988, it would have made it extremely difficult for the British government to have censored us. But uh, before I come to that, I'd just like to speak a bit about what happened in 1988. And Margaret Thatcher brought in the broadcasting ban against Sinn Féin. Uh, she says that it would not interfere with the political electoral process because Sinn Féin in the run-up to an election would be allowed to take part in party political broadcasts. But as anyone who's involved in politics knows, that you win elections between elections, mm -hmm. not just in the run-up to the election. So that was, that was aimed at hurting us. And uh, even though some conscientious journalists decided to try and make a farce of it by bringing in actors uh, to, to mimic our, our words or to put subtitles up, which would uh, pr presumably alert the public that, hold on a minute, why is there subtitles up? That guy's speaking English. The, the fact of the matter is that it proved physically very difficult for them to do it when they're approaching a six o'clock news deadline at night. So. Whilst the statistics show from our office the, the queries to it in the four months uh, prior to the introduction of the broadcasting ban, I think we had something like five, six hundred inquiries. 
in the four months after it, that had dropped to about 90 or 100. And that also meant that if we weren't on local radio, journalists wouldn't hear that story. And so we'd be missing out on all sorts of ways. So uh, on top of the broadcasting ban, incidentally, I should say this, they also introduced exclusion orders. So I was the director of publicity. I was elected to the Northern Ireland Assembly and they introduced an exclusion order to keep me from going to England to make a speech. And that exclusion order lasted for 14 years. If I had breached it, I got five years in jail for speaking in, in England. And it was all to deprive the British public access to what was going on. So the censorship mm -hmm. applied to the people there mm -hmm. in the sense that they were deprived of hearing alternate views about why their sons and daughters were losing their, losing their lives in a foreign war in another country. But the rise of, of social media, and back then, and to, to, to uh, maintain a presence, we tried to bring out weekly videos and we would give them to the clubs and the pubs. But even that was hard to, to maintain. We still had our paper uh, on Fublock Republican News. And of course, the British Army and the RUC continually stopped our drivers at checkpoints and tried to deprive people you know, of, of a proper service of delivery. So with the, with the rise of social media and with the rise of the internet, I think most opponents of Sinn Féin are of the opinion that Sinn Féin has outshone them all in terms of its mastery of, of those particular platforms, those medias, Instagram, Snapchat, uh, Twitter, etc., Facebook. Now, I, I myself only deal in Twitter. I'm only capable of dealing with one platform at a time. But it's really, it's, it's fantastic the reach that you, that you can make. Of course, the downside is the proliferation of conspiracy theorists, mm -hmm. uh, rumours, misinformation, untruths, mm -hmm. which are really... You spend a lot of your time actually trying to counter that. I simply just block people. Once I suspect people are of a fascist tendency or misogynist or racist and maybe trying to make a clever remark covering it, once I, I just go into their, their, into their other messages, if I say anything like, like that at all, I block it. I don't see why they should be able to reach you know, 30,000, 40,000 people on my back. So that, that is an approach that I have. But there's no doubt about it that if we had had Twitter in 1988, we would have defeated the whole purpose of the broadcasting ban. Yeah. Well, let, let me put in my next question. So w with this proliferation of, of disinformation, we've seen, for example, the growth of the right uh, in the Irish Republic, etc. Something you, you wouldn't have seen maybe 10, 15 years ago. I mean, what's, what's your take on that? Well, that's the, the, the downside of it. Yeah, there's, there's always two sides to a coin. And the fact of the matter is that they're able to exploit it. They're, they've been able to mobilise people for these you know, instant protests uh, uh, for where asylum seekers have been allocated maybe uh, rooms in a hotel, even in a small village. Years ago, news like that would never have leaked out. But they're able to instantly respond. So, of course, they're going to take advantage of it. But that's one of the, the battles that we have to fight. You know, there is a, an ideological battle going on with them. But I think they've also been fairly countered on social media. Uh, they've been exposed. Some several of their leaders, who you know wrap themselves in the tricolour, have been exposed with actually having secret contacts with the British National Front with mm -hmm. Nazis. So they haven't been that successful. And I believe because I believe that our case is morally superior. I think that ultimately we get out the message there with the truth. We will win. So Danny. Um, we've got you on the show here today. I'd like you to talk a wee bit about the Bobby Sands Trust, of which you're secretary. Can you tell us a bit about it and what your work entails? Well, back whenever I was the editor of Republican News, I was in constant contact with the prisoners, especially in the run-up to the 1980 hunger strike, so I would have visited Bobby Sands quite regularly. And I'd, a I'd asked Bobby, would he do some writing for our paper? So using his, uh, the pen name of Marcella, his uh, sister, he wrote lots of poetry and uh, short stories and of course he kept a diary for the first 17 days of his hunger strike in 1981 which has never gone out of print in like 42, 43 years, never gone out of print. And Bobby's lyrics of course have been uh, adopted as songs and sang by many thousands of, of artists around the world and has, uh, has been con uh, has on many CDs etc. So b the Bobby Sands' writings are very, very important record of the conflict within the prisons because what was going on in the prisons was also censorship. Mm -hmm. It was an attempt to repudiate that these people were political 
and had political objectives by trying to say, no, they're criminals, they're ordinary prisoners, when the whole process that they went through, so for example, they were arrested under special laws. They were brought to special interrogation centres where they were questioned under special rules. They then went to non-jury courts where the onus was on the defendant to prove innocence. And then suddenly when they get to this jail, they're no, they're no longer special, they're ordinary prisoners. And of course, if you look at Irish history, the first hunger striker died in 1917, mm -hmm. Thomas House. So Britain wasn't ignorant of this. They knew what they were doing and they decided they couldn't defeat the IRA on the streets, so we'll let us try and defeat their prisoners and demoralise their organisation from within. The most vulnerable of people, man in a cell, surrounded by eight to ten prison officers, a third of whom were former British soldiers, on big bounties for working in these conditions, and they tried to break the prisoners. So that is a heroic story in itself. What went on in Armagh, women in Armagh jail, and the men, the young men, mostly teenagers, many of them, in the hitch blocks of Long Cash, just upended British rule in Ireland, the British narrative on Ireland. And you know, Bobby Sands this day is, is absolutely famous. His name, in people around the world would know his name before they would know Margaret Thatcher's name. Gardens, roads have been named after him in, 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 uh, when, they were, when the ANC were preparing a hunger strike. The code word was Sands, etc. So it's quite an honour to be Secretary of the Bobby Sands Trust. We preserved as much of his writings that we, that we could. Like he, he wrote lots of poems on the walls which were destroyed by prison officers. But this, the, what the, he smuggled out letters and poems and uh, songs and uh, two books, you know, the, the diary and One Day in My Life. Uh, we have them in an archive in the National Library in Dublin and over a period of time, as they become digitalised, we will be putting them into, a, into for the public to see. So I believe you have uh, recently written a play and there's rehearsals uh, occurring presently. Uh, can you tell us a bit about that? Yes, we're in rehearsals right now. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is a play that I adopted from, well, inspired by a book by a former psychiatric nurse who then became my country and western DJ on local radio, uh, Bobby Hanvey, but there wasn't enough material in his book. So it's set in a psychiatric hospital, it's about a psychiatric nurse. It's set in 1968, just as people are preparing to go on the big march in Derry and Duke Street on the 5th of October, which many people perceive or say is the start of the conflict. The first time a tax on our people river filmed and you saw the RUC batting charging a, a group of civil rights uh, protesters. So that's it's set in that period. And in parallel with the crisis going on politically, my nurse, uh, Bernard Flanagan, he's also suffering a personal crisis. And towards the end of the play, it all becomes clear as both stories mesh. Danny, I want to thank you for coming in today. It's always a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you. We're almost out of time, but I'd like to thank once again our guest Danny Morrison and our resident co-host Michelle Gildernew. Now the history of Ireland is a rich and vibrant one and I'd like to share with you a special moment from the boats, one that involves the most unlikely of encounters. In 1957, Paul Robeson, the famous American musician and stage actor, released The Ballad of Kevin Barry, an Irish revolutionary song dedicated to the life and death of a young Irish patriot who was hanged by the British government during the War of Independence in 1920. But how did this great musical icon come into the possession of this renowned Irish ballad? According to author Donald O'Driscoll, this was the result of a chance meeting in the most unlikely of circumstances. Potter O'Donnell, a well-known Irish socialist and a veteran of the Irish War of Independence and Spanish Civil War, embarked on a journey to the United States in 1939. According to O'Driscoll, Potter was stranded at a roadside with a burst tyre when a limousine stopped and offered help. He was invited to sit in the car by the passenger while the driver fixed the puncture. The passenger turned out to be Paul Robeson, who told Potter that he would like to record an Irish song. O'Donnell suggested Kevin Barry, the ballad glorifying the young IRA man hanged by the British in 1920, which he said conveyed the spirit of Ireland. He proceeded to teach the song to Robeson. O'Donnell himself went on to become an accomplished novelist and playwright, while Robeson was later persecuted by the FBI and the political right, due to his vocal support for the Soviets in the aftermath of the Second World War. 
He had been impressed by the absence of negative racial attitudes towards him during his visit to the Soviet Union. In the 1950s, McCarthyism and the Red Scare dominated the headlines, and many artists, scientists or academics with leftist affiliations who failed to denounce communism became unemployed and blacklisted. Don't forget to share the Rumble link to today's programme to help us grow our audience. And if you don't already, you can also follow the show on Facebook, Twitter and Telegram. In the meantime, the conversation will be back next week with more investigations and analysis. I'm Sean Murray. This has been The Conversation. Until next time.